Hello, everyone, and a hearty welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled CRISPRs, Ushering in a New Age of Gene Editing. CRISPRs, doesn't that word have a great ring to it? Now, people not involved in biotech might think CRISPRs are something from Kellogg's. But for all of you who work in the life sciences, you know CRISPRs have become one of the hottest technologies around. And why? Well, as the title of our webinar states, they're ushering in a new age of gene editing. To tell us more about CRISPRs and where the technology might take us, we've assembled a star panel of CRISPR experts. Let's meet them. Dr. Rodolph Barangu serves as Adjunct Professor of Food Science at North Carolina State University. Dr. Barangu will explore CRISPR-Cas systems and their applications. Dr. Feng Zhang carries out research at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Dr. Zhang will present additional details on genome editing using CRISPR-Cas9 and also provide some examples of the system in action. Dr. George Church is professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School. He's also director of personalgenomes.org, which provides the world's only open access information on human genomic, environmental, and trait data. Dr. Church is going to talk about CRISPR applications beyond tools, libraries, and disease models. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as moderator. After the panelists make their presentations, we'll hold a question and answer session. Feel free to send in a question for our panelists at any time during the webinar. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible. So if everyone's ready, let's get going. Rodolf Berengu will be our lead off presenter, so I'm turning the program over to him. Rodolf? Good afternoon. My primary objective today is to introduce CRISPR-Cas systems and provide an overview of the applications with focus on type 2 systems and specifically Cas9 mediated DNA cleavage and genome editing. The primary biological function in vivo of native CRISPR-Cas systems is actually to provide sequence specific interfering RNA mediated adaptive immunity in prokaryotes. These systems occur in nearly half of the bacterial genome and the large majority of archaea as well. CRISPR-Cas systems are composed of two main elements. On one hand, the top right, the clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, CRISPR, which form peculiar arrays of DNA repeats interspersed by elements called spacers. On the other hand, the top left, uh, CRISPR-associated sequences, or Cas genes, which encode accessory proteins that, together with the CRISPR array, constitute what is called a CRISPR-Cas system. These systems do provide adaptive immunity in bacteria and archaea through three distinct molecular steps. The first step, acquisition, represents the vaccination stage uh, during which a new spacer is spliced from an invasive exogenous nucleic acid, such as a phage or a plasmid, and this protospacer sequence yields a spatial sequence which is associated with a new CRISPR repeat and this repeat spacer unit is uh, specifically integrated at one end of the CRISPR locus, generating uh, an immunized event. Secondly, uh, during the exp expression stage or the CRISPR RNA biogenesis step, the CRISPR array is transcribed as a long precursor CRISPR RNA pre-CR RNA, which is subsequently processed into mature uh, small interfering RNAs that typically contain a portion of a spacer uh, and a portion of a CRISPR repeat. Lastly, during the interference stage, uh, CRRNAs, CRISPR RNAs, guide Cas endonucleases towards complementary nucleic acids for sequence-specific DNA cleavage. Altogether, those CRISPR-Cas systems provide adaptive immunity in uh, bacteria and archaea. Now, overall, there are three distinct types of CRISPR-Cas systems, uh, namely type 1, type 2, and type 3, and those systems carry distinct sets of Cas genes and corresponding Cas proteins as established by Makarova and Kuhn in, in uh, 2011. Cas1 and Cas2 are universally distributed, uh, whereas Cas3, Cas9, and Cas10 are the signature genes that exclusively occur 
uh, in types 1, 2, and 3, respectively. Uh, noteworthy for today, uh, Cas9 is actually the signature gene for type 2 systems, which happen to be the most uh, streamlined CRISPR-Cas systems, as you can see here, with only four genes um, and proteins. Although the uh, molecular underpinnings of these CRISPR-Cas systems uh, vary between those three major types, uh, there are many common mechanistic and biochemical processes that they share. Uh, noteworthy, all three types rely on small interfering CRISPR RNAs, CRRNAs, that all guide Cas nucleases, uh, which eventually yield sequence-specific targeting and nucleic acid cleavage. For type 1 and type 2 systems, um, the system is uh, specific for what's called a protospacer adjacent motif, protospacer associated motif, a PAM, uh, on the cognate target, and those elements are very important for target recognition and uh, subsequent cleavage as well. Although most CRISPR-Cas systems target DNA, and you can notice on the bottom of the right that type 3B systems target RNA, but those are the exception rather than the rule. And uh, interestingly, type 2 systems uh, have thus far been exclusively observed in bacteria only. Now, if one looks at the CRISPR literature over time, it actually dates back all the way to 1987, where CRISPR arrays were first observed in an intergenic region flanking the IAP gene in E. coli. And these peculiar, unusual genetic loci were mostly anecdotal until they were repeatedly observed in the genomes of bacteria and archaea as uh, microbial genome sequencing became widespread in the late 90s and early 2000s. And the CRISPR acronym itself was only coned in uh, 2002, nearly 15 years after their initial observation in the E. coli sequence. Although they were originally um, and erroneously predicted to be involved in chromosome partitioning, uh, transcriptional regulation, uh, DNA repair, and, and other potential functions early on, the, the observation in 2005, actually three distinct papers published uh, within a short period in the summer of 2005, uh, all showed homology uh, of spacers to viral and plasmid sequences in bacteria and archaea. And this led to the hypothesis uh, within a year in 2006 uh, postulated by Makarova and Kunin that those CRISPR-Cas systems may actually constitute uh, an immune system in, in archaea and bacteria. Uh, shortly thereafter, we actually showed in 2007 that indeed those CRISPR arrays in combination with Cas genes do provide adaptive immunity against viruses. And several subsequent studies uh, in 2008 uh, established that the overall process is RNA-mediated, uh, that was shown by the von der Roos lab from Wageningen University. Um, and then within a couple of months, uh, Sontheimer and Mara Fini showed that DNA uh, is the primary target uh, of CRISPR-Cas systems. Uh, we also showed in 2010 that CRISPR-Cas systems um, specifically cleave DNA. And then shortly thereafter, in 2011, 2012, and 2013, a few critical milestone uh, discoveries established CRISPR-Cas systems for genome editing, which led us to the CRISPR craze. So if you look at the literature profile over time, uh, it is rather obvious that the field has grown exponentially since 2007, and you can see firsthand on the right that the genome editing application uh, that we've all witnessed in the last 12 months with the CRISPR craze in 2013 uh, has led to an explosion of the CRISPR literature, CRISPR interest, and CRISPR applications. So if we look at CRISPR applications overall, there are three main types of CRISPR-based exploitations. Firstly, and, and originally, uh, because spacers are acquired in a polarized manner at one end of the CRISPR locus, these peculiar genetic elements provide a, a genetic tape record of immunization events over time. Uh, they can accordingly be used to provide insights into the origin and the evolution of a strain or several strains and be used to compare and contrast uh, strains. This has been extensively used for bacterial phylogeny and epidemiological studies of foods um, and, and pathogen outbreaks, notably for E. coli and salmonella. 
And these loci can also provide insights into host virus population dynamics and microbial diversity in complex samples and metagenomic surveys. A subsequent application has been the exploitation of their natural immune function to actually vaccinate strains uh, of interest against exogenous nucleic acids like viruses. Um, CRISPRs have been used already and exploited in the food industry for the natural development and formulation of dairy starter cultures that are commonly used, even as of today, for the global manufacturing of cheese and, and yogurt fermentation as well, where actually phage predation uh, has been and still remains an industrial problem. Uh, we also showed uh, that CRISPR-Cas systems can be leveraged for either natural or engineered vaccination against plasmids, and this can be exploited to prevent the uptake and dissemination of things like antibiotic-resistant genes or, or pathogenic traits. Uh, more recently, uh, we showed that CRISPR-Cas systems can be engineered for self-targeting and may actually uh, show some potential as next-generation antibiotics for strain-specific removal of selected bacterial species of strains, um, and there's some potential there that is yet to be unraveled. Lastly, and, for, and, and importantly for, for today, the molecular potential of Cas proteins, uh, specifically Cas9, has already been harnessed and repurposed for a number of important applications, notably genome editing, uh, transcriptional control, and genetic screens. So let's, let's dig into Cas9 genetics, Cas9 functionality, and Cas9 biology. So we showed originally in 2007 uh, that CRISPR spacers specifically provide adaptive and sequence-specific immunity against viruses and phages. Uh, noteworthy, we showed that immunity can be reprogrammed by specifically engineering uh, desired CRISPR spacers into a wild-type CRISPR array. And we also showed in that same study that Cas9, uh, which was originally named Cas1, uh, has also been named Cas5, uh, was named CSN1 for a long time, and eventually Cas9. So Cas9 is necessary for CRISPR-dependent targeting um, and spacers alone do not suffice for interference. We also showed a few years later, uh, back in 2010, that Cas9 is actually uh, involved in and responsible for plasmid DNA cleavage as well as phage DNA cleavage. And specifically, we showed in this study that blunt double-stranded DNA cleavage occurs exactly three nucleotides away from the three prime end of the protospacer sequence in the immediate vicinity of the PAM. Uh, this was done all in, in, in Streptomophilus uh, CRISPR-Cas systems. The same system uh, was uh, subsequently studied, and we also showed in 2011 that this native CRISPR-Cas system can be transferred heterologously to other bacteria in this particular case from Streptomophilus uh, to E. coli, and can, can be readily reprogrammed to target plasmids uh, or viruses, like in this particular case, phage, phage lambda. We confirmed in this study as well that targeting strictly requires a Cas9, uh, CSN1 on this slide, and we showed that the HNH motif was necessary for targeting and preventing the uptake and the acquisition of uh, plasmid sequences by the strain. This same study also showed that targeting is heavily sequence specific and actually that a perfect match at the three prime end of the spacer is necessary for cleavage, uh, whereas in contrast, SNPs can be tolerated if they are located more than uh, five or five-ish nucleotides away from the cleavage site uh, at the five prime end of the protospacer. In contrast, a single SNP uh, R or near the cleavage site uh, actually will prevent Cas9 endonucleolytic activity. And the same was shown for mutations in the PAM on the right, uh, where you see that uh, uh, changing the GGNG PAM uh, will preclude the occurrence of cleavage by Cas9. Lastly, we showed in 2012 uh, that indeed there are two uh, distinct important motifs for Cas9 cleavage, 
uh, namely RUVC and HNH, and that both are involved in the target DNA cleavage, and that actually each single motif serves as a DNA strand nickase, uh, RUVC for the plus strand, and the HNH for the minus strand. So all those elements actually uh, were scientifically interesting, but, but not as exciting to the global community until what I call the sgRNA tipping point. And in my opinion, the study by uh, Ginek and colleagues at the Dana Lab at UC Berkeley uh, did provide the a tipping point or the tipping point for the CRISPR field back in 2012 when they actually showed that the native CRISPR RNA tracer RNA duplex can be artificially replaced by a single guide RNA chimera, sgRNA, uh, which links CRISPR RNA on one side and tracer RNA on the other side. And this really allowed uh, this technology to, 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 to change and be readily exploitable uh, for flexible reprogramming and packaging of CRISPR-Cas systems using a single protein, namely Cas9, and a single molecule, uh, namely the single guide RNA, for programmable and transferable uh, DNA cleavage. So the CRISPR-Cas9 craze, or the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution, uh, occurred shortly thereafter, and actually within a couple of months of the, the Ginec et al. study, uh, the, the Fang Zhang group, the George Church group, and the Mara Finney lab uh, all concurrently and very elegantly and compellingly showed that this system, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, can be readily packaged for heterologous genome editing, and those milestone studies arguably set the stage for the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing craze uh, we all witnessed in 2013 with arguably very significant uh, translational and research impacts. So as we can see here, there are four distinct forms of Cas9 that can be readily exploited for various applications, uh, one being the wild-type Cas9, which can be used to generate uh, double-stranded breaks, uh, whereas either an, an HNH minus Nikase or a RUVC minus Nikase uh, can be used for single strand uh, DNA nicking. And lastly, uh, an inactivated version of Cas9, widely called DCAS9, uh, which is inactive uh, enzymatically but can solely bind DNA in a sequence specific manner as shown in the Stanley Key lab. So those elements uh, have, uh, are, and will continue to be uh, exploited for genome editing applications using CRISPR-Cas9, and essentially Cas9-mediated uh, double-stranded break cleavage can be harnessed for targeted mutagenesis in combination with the, the native DNA repair machinery in various organisms. So as shown at the top, one option is the error-prone non-homologous uh, and joining NHEJ repair, which can be used to generate either SNPs or insertions or deletions uh, at the site of cleavage. Alternatively, another option is uh, homologous recombination HR, which can be exploited for more surgical edits by specifically providing a DNA repair template with the engineered or desirable edits uh, which can be a SNP or could be an insertion or could be a, a deletion as well. Uh, although the uh, strepogenes model uh, has been uh, heavily used uh, for the single guide RNA technology, there are other systems uh, that can be rarely exploited already, uh, notably the, the Strathomophilus systems I mentioned earlier today, and those can be used uh, with the wild type of space array as well. And there is a number of other Cas9 proteins in combination with their respective PAMs uh, that have been and likely are being developed as well, uh, perhaps even as we speak. So Cas9-mediated genome editing uh, can be exploited in two different ways, uh, either using the wild-type CRISPR system, uh, which uh, exploits the, the native CRISPR array in combination with Cas9, as well as the tracer RNA and, and RNA-3,4 processing, or alternatively, this system can be readily repackaged using exclusively Cas9 in combination with the sgRNA single-guide RNA chimera. 
And the advantages of this technology include flexible programmable targeting or, or reprogrammable targeting, uh, sequence-specific DNA cleavage. Uh, this system can be readily uh, uh, heterologously transferred using uh, codon-optimized versions or even NLS-containing versions of Cas9. Uh, the cleavage uh, is arguably efficient, uh, precise. Uh, the design overall is affordable, uh, quick, and cloning and implementation can occur within days, uh, if not weeks. And then the ability to multiplex the system using multiple guys concurrently uh, or multiple Y-type spacers within an array um, uh, is, is really promising for multiple edits, uh, either iteratively or concurrently. And then last but not least, uh, it was shown by the Church Lab uh, that there are several distinct orthogonal systems that could potentially be used uh, and paired together for different purposes. Now, nevertheless, notwithstanding the, the tremendous list of advantages that we see here, uh, there are a few, a few caveats to have in mind, notably the fact that Cas9 has and, and still remains a fairly large protein um, at, at, at above 4 kb and, and sometimes in excess of, of 1,400 amino acids. Um, to a lesser extent, you know, targeting precision uh, is based on PAM sequences and availability. Uh, so for, for guide design or, or, or cleavage targeting, there's some flexibility, but it's, it's not absolute whatsoever. Um, and then last but not least, some groups have reported uh, some of target issues, uh, but there are ways to alleviate those with optimal guide design, perhaps using longer PAMs. And as we'll hear later today, I think the, the elegant use of uh, a, a dual knee cases uh, for, for two NICs on, on, on different strands. So... In addition to Cas9-based uh, genome editing, uh, there are already other repurposing applications that have been established um, uh, based on Cas9, uh, notably the ability to exploit inactivated versions of Cas9 to repress transcription by blocking RNA polymerase, uh, which has been coined CRISPR interference, CRISPR-I. And I think we are already looking at applications beyond genome editing. Uh, there, there are several recent developments that have shown you can use Cas9 um, and fuse it with different functional domains of interest for transcriptional activation, CRISPR on, and, and possibly a whole new series uh, of fusion proteins to manipulate DNA structure, uh, DNA content, um, and even DNA function. So I think I think this here is the point in time at which we can already start anticipating the next generation of CRISPR applications. So at this point in time, I think we have a good understanding of, of CRISPR-Cas systems, what they are, how they work, and how specifically Cas9 proteins can be exploited for a number of applications, notably uh, genome engineering and, and gene editing. And I would like to take a minute to acknowledge all my CRISPR collaborators over the years, uh, notably my former group at DuPont, uh, the Moineau Lab and the Cisnes Lab in, in Vilnius with whom uh, I've worked and, and, and presented some of their work today. I think this, this sets the stage for the subsequent talk we're going to hear from uh, Feng Zhang and George. Back to John. Thank you, Rodolf, for that excellent overview of CRISPRs as genome editing tools. You've laid out the groundwork for the presentations to follow very well, so thanks again. If you are just now joining our webinar, welcome. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be conducting a Q&A segment following the panelists' presentations. Please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Fang Zheng, is ready to begin his presentation. So, Fang, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Feng Zhang, and I'm an assistant professor at MIT and also a core member at the Broad Institute. CRISPR-Cas technology has started to enable a lot of very exciting applications in a variety of genetic and engineering experiments. One of the most exciting advances in the past decade has been the growth in our ability to analyze genetic variations in large numbers of individuals. So this is a plot from the National Institute of Health, and it shows the exponential growth in the number of publications reporting genome-wide association hits. One thing to remember from this plot is that these genetic variations are correlated or linked to a particular disease, but we actually don't know if they play a causal role. And so given this rapid rise, we also need a complementary technology to help us 
in a high throughput fashion, identify those genetic mutations that are causal in specific disease mechanisms. One of the approaches for quickly understanding the causal role of genetic variation is through genome engineering. The idea is very simple. You can start from a well-studied healthy stem cell, and by engineering the genome of this cell, you can then introduce a genetic variation that you would like to study and see whether or not it causes a disease state. And using this engineered cell, you can make a perfect comparison to the healthy stem cell because they only differ in the genetic mutation of interest. And by taking both of these cells, uh, scientists can differentiate them into the relevant type of tissue. So if we want to study a neurological disease, we can convert them into neurons and then start to compare their morphology or physiology or any other type of uh, property within the cells. So the differences observed can be attributed to the genetic mutation. And this is a technology that we can start to scale up and generate and study many different kinds of genetic variations at once. So how do you go about making a precise change within the genome to recapitulate a genetic mutation? It turns out that there is an elegant way to harness the endogenous machinery within the cell, either the non-homologous injoining pathway or the homology directed repair pathway to make a change. This was first demonstrated by Dana Carroll and colleagues from the University of Utah back in 2002. And what we need to do to make this work is to introduce a double-strand break within the targeted region in the genome. And NHEJ allows us to knock out gene functions very efficiently because the double-strand break is rejoined uh, with the formation of a small indel mutation. So if this indel is introduced in the coding region for a given gene, then it will lead to a frame shift mutation and then deplete uh, the protein expression within the cell. Alternatively, the homology direct repair pathway allows us to make a more precise change by providing a template that is homologous to the broken DNA ends, but carrying a small uh, change that we want to introduce. It is possible to uh, increase the efficiency through which the, re the mutation can be incorporated into the target genome. So both of these technologies are possible uh, to allow us to study uh, the roles of genes and genetic variations, but what we need to uh, do to make this happen efficiently is to create a double-strand break uh, with high efficiency. To develop a way to make double-strand break efficiently, uh, we turn to the CRISPR system. In addition to the CRISPR system, there have been multiple technologies developed over the past uh, decade or two, including the thin finger nuclease the meganuclease, and also the transcription activator-like effector nuclease technology. But those technologies depend on the ability to engineer a protein to recognize a specific DNA sequence. What is elegant about CRISPR is that the specificity of DNA recognition is achieved through, through a short RNA sequence. And so by simply altering the composition of this RNA uh, using Watson-Crick uh, uh, nucleic acid base pairing code, uh, we can very easily uh, target uh, the enzyme to a specific location uh, on the target genome. The CRISPR system is really one of the uh, more elegant um, uh, basic science stories. Um, the, the system, as Rudolf told us, um, it was discovered in 1987, and then it wasn't until 20 years later that scientists had started uh, to uncover the biological function. And then over the past um, 8 to 10 years, uh, scientists have started to unravel the different kinds of mechanisms, uh, starting from understanding the role of the system in antiviral defense uh, to characterizing the systems uh, in 2010 and 2011, the different enzyme and also RNA components that are necessary to carry out CRISPR activity. So when I started my lab in 2011, we turned to the system and thought, can we develop it for doing genome engineering uh, in mammalian uh, eukaryotic cells? So three uh, graduate students joined my lab, uh, Le Tung, uh, Anne Ren, and also Patrick Su, and we set out to engineer two different kinds of CRISPR loci, one from the Streptococcus thermophilus bacteria, which is an a, a organism that's typically used in the dairy industry, and also a pathogen uh, from the Streptococcus pyogenes system. And both of these systems uh, share very common uh, features. They all have an enzyme called Cas9, 
and they also uh, carry two non-coding RNA elements, one called the tracer RNA and another called the CRISPR repeat. This CRISPR repeat is where the variable sequences uh, from phages are inserted into the bacterial genome. So based on the work um, from other uh, groups that characterize the, uh, the individual components of the CRISPR system, we thought to see can we introduce uh, the minimal but functional set of CRISPR elements into mammalian cells. And there were four different components um, that were uh, essential. One is the Cas9 enzyme, which is the nucleus carrying out the cleavage activity, uh, as Sylvain Moenu showed back in 2000, 2010. Uh, but also uh, the two RNA elements, one for CRISPR repeat as well as for tracer RNA. So uh, Emmanuel Charpentier also showed in 2011 that uh, the RNA-3 from the host bacteria is required to mature the RNA into a form that can be loaded onto Cas9. Uh, so we also introduced the fourth component into cells. To test whether or not the system can modify uh, the genomic DNA within a mammalian cell, we took the human genome and then re-engineered the CRISPR spacer sequence uh, to target a specific 30 base pair sequence on the human genome uh, in the EMX1 locus. And by introducing all four components and then making sure and engineering the tracer RNA so that it can express at sufficient levels, we found that introduction of all four components can indeed mediate double strand breaks uh, within the target locus uh, in EMX1. And what is also interesting from uh, one of our experiments is that you only need three and not, um, you don't need the RNA-3 molecule. So, um, so likely there is a component uh, within the mammalian cell uh, that provides for that function as well. So while we were doing this work, um, other groups have continued to characterize the biochemistry and the, and the biology of the system. And so two studies came out in 2012, one from the group of um, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, and another one from uh, Virginia Sickness, and they demonstrate that Cas9 can indeed uh, cleave DNA uh, in in vitro. What is interesting, and also as uh, Rudolf uh, per, uh, pointed out earlier, is that the two RNA from CRISPR can be fused to form a single guide RNA. So we saw this and thought, can we uh, compare the efficiency of the two different RNA forms? And we compared the single guide RNA reported in Genic et al. Uh, with the two RNA forms that we were introducing into cells. To our surprise, the single guide RNA actually didn't work very well. It, um, it was able to cleave in some cases, but um, the double RNA was um, by far much more robust. So we were a bit puzzled and we started to compare the two different RNA forms. And we realized that one of the differences between the two RNA uh, complex versus the single guide RNA is that the three prime region of the tracer RNA uh, is much longer. There are secondary structures that are likely important uh, for maintaining the stability or uh, maintaining uh, the uh, interaction with the Cas9 uh, protein. And so uh, we thought to try to optimize uh, this uh, guide RNA. And one thing we did is we started to extend the three prime tail of the guide RNA. And what we found is as soon as we started to include uh, one or both of the hairpins on the three prime region, we were able to significantly increase uh, the cleavage activity of Cas9 within uh, cells. And by doing a northern blot, we also found that these modifications uh, further increase the presence, uh, the level of expression of the guide RNA within cells. So George Church uh, published a paper at the same time as our initial science study, and they also report uh, the long form of the, trace R, uh, of the single guide RNA uh, to work uh, most effect effectively. So that sums up the system. There are only two components that you need to introduce into cells. The first one is the Cas9 enzyme, and then the second one is the appropriately programmed guide RNA that targets uh, the specific region of the genome that you want to cut. Once you do that, uh, you can induce a double strand break quite efficiently and then start to stimulate genome editing via either the non-homologous injoining or the homology-directed repair pathways. So here is one application um, of the CRISPR system to introduce a small mutation within the human genome. In this example, we use Cas9 to target and make a double strand break in the EMX1 locus. And at the same time, we provided a single-stranded oligonucleotide template that is mostly homologous to the cleaved region, but in between the two homology arms, uh, there is a small mutation. And in HTK cells, we found that CRISPR uh, can induce up to 27% uh, 
homologous recombination from the single strand oligo, and in ES cells we can get up to 6% homologous recombination. So both of these efficiencies are several orders of magnitude uh, than the basal level of homologous recombination without introducing a double strand break using CRISPR Cas9. In addition to modifying cells, which are useful for generating cellular models, uh, we worked with Rudolf Inish at the Whitehead Institute, and we found that you can use CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer animal models with specific uh, mutations efficiently as well. By taking single-cell fertilized embryos and injecting the messenger RNA for Cas9, as well as the guide RNA to target both the TET1 and also TET2 gene, we found that you can simultaneously knock out uh, both um, genes, all four alleles, with up to 30% efficiency. Although sometimes in some animals there are mosaicism, um, this overall increases the throughput by which we can engineer um, animals with specific mutations. One of the important criteria for um, Cas9 function is that it has to be specific. So in one study, uh, we took a single guide RNA and then computationally predicted all of the genomic regions that share high levels of similarity. So we identified a list of sites that differ by one, two, or three uh, bases. What we found is that um, although Cas9 is unable to cleave at most of those uh, sites, occasionally it is able to mediate a cleavage event uh, at some of these sites that share uh, high levels of similarity. What that means is we need to develop other ways to overcome the off-targeting um, uh, concern uh, of the Cas9 system. And so one strategy that we developed is um, by learning a lesson from the, uh, the Talon or the zinc finger nuclease system, where rather than using a single guide RNA to recognize a single st uh, stretch of DNA sequence, we try to uh, use two different guide RNAs so that we can double the number of bases that need to be recognized. And the way that uh, this works is by first converting the wild type Cas9, which can cleave both strands of DNA, into a nicking enzyme uh, by mutating one of the two catalytic uh, nuclease domains. And this system can work quite well. So as long as you uh, follow a couple of criteria, for the D10A uh, Cas9 nicase, where we inactivate the rough C domain, we found that as long as the two guide RNAs are spaced not too far or not to, and not too close, uh, with an offset of between 0 to 30 base pairs, and um, leaving a 5' uh, overhang, then we can introduce indel mutations via NHEJ with similar levels of efficiency uh, as using uh, wild-type Cas9. And furthermore, this system is able to reduce off-target activity. Um, so taking one of the guides, target one, that we know to have five different off-target sites, we found that by switching to the double nicking system using the D10A nicase and two guides, target one and also target nine, we can overcome uh, the, the NHEJ modification at the five known off-target sites. So this was able to increase the specificity uh, by over a thousand fold. So we summarized um, all these uh, experimental procedures into a very comprehensive uh, protocol that was published uh, last year. Uh, so uh, uh, research groups can follow uh, the step-by-step -step procedure uh, to apply the system to engineering a variety of different kinds of experimental models. In addition, we built a computational tool which is accessible um, at tools.genome-engineering.org uh, where researchers can paste in a region of the genome that they would like to target, and then the tool will computationally uh, try to suggest um, target sequences either for the wild-type Cas9 or for double nicking uh, to, um, to target that region. So toward the end of last year, 2013, we, uh, we um, uh, we described the study where we try to expand the way that we can use CRISPR uh, to target genes across the genome. And this was done by um, developing a screening methodology that we call GECKO. It stands for Genome Scale CRISPR Knockout Screen. The way it works is very similar to a, S a pooled shRNA uh, functional screen. We first designed uh, single guide RNAs targeting the early and conserved exons of every annotated gene within the human genome. And then using oligo array DNA synthesis, we can generate uh, specific DNA oligos uh, targeting, each one, uh, targeting each one of the um, sites. And by cloning um, these oligos into a lentivirus library, 
we now have a lengthy CRISPR library that can target uh, every single gene uh, within the human genome. So you can transduce a population of cells and then generate a, a library of cells that collectively uh, have individual uh, genes knocked out. And by applying a uh, screening or bioassay to these cells, we can then identify particular gene mutations uh, that lead to a given uh, phenotype. To first see whether or not the lengthy CRISPR system can work as well as shRNA to mediate gene knockdown, uh, we compared um, CRISPR versus shRNA using a GFP reporter cell line. And what we found is that when the GFP cell line received lengthy CRISPR, we were able to completely deplete GFP expression, uh, whereas for shRNA, we were able to significantly uh, reduce the level of GFP expression, but we weren't able to completely deplete. And so given this result, we started to apply this uh, to a uh, model of a melanoma. So we took the human A375 cells, and then we transduced them uh, with the lengthy CRISPR library so that we'll have a library of melanoma cells uh, with the um, uh, V600E mutation uh, that have individual genes knocked out. And by applying a drug called vemurafenib onto these uh, cells, what we found is that we were able to identify specific genes when knocked out is able to mediate um, a, um, a resistance um, against the vimorafenib drug. And by comparing uh, this screen with the shRNA pooled screen, we found that CRISPR can actually work quite well. Um, for the top 100 targets, we found that consistently um, the top 100 gecko targets had a lower p-value, suggesting higher significance uh, than the shRNA hits. And if we zoom in a little bit and look at the top 10 targets, we find that the degree of consistency across the multiple guide RNA targeting the same gene is much higher than the multiple shRNAs targeting the same gene. So there's more agreement uh, between the different CRISPR uh, sgRNAs than the, the different shRNAs. And functionally, uh, this the ability of CRISPR to mediate a complete gene depletion versus shRNA mediating a gene knockdown can also have a functional significance. So by applying um, the vemurafenib drug to uh, A375 cells that have the NF2 gene knocked out, uh, we found that when you have CRISPR knockout, uh, we see a robust uh, growth phenotype uh, with um, this NF2 mutation. But when we do shRNA knockdown, uh, we don't actually see that. So in cases where um, only de complete depletion of a gene can provide um, a biological readout, um, CRISPR uh, may likely have an advantage. In addition to um, making genetic changes on the genome, right. uh, CRISPR can also be used to modulate transcription or recruit effector domains to specific locations on the genome. By mutating both of the uh, catalytic domains on Cas9, we can convert it uh, into DCAS9 so that we can recruit an effector domain uh, to the target. And if the effector domain can be a transcription activator or repressor or some kind of epigenetic modifying enzyme or even GSP to visualize a specific genomic locus. So what we found is that uh, indeed this system can work. So by fusing Cas9 to VP64, we can directly activate an endogenous gene and by fusing Cas9 to SID4X, we can then repress an endogenous gene uh, within the human genome. So that's all I want to say today. Uh, in summary, uh, the CRISPR and also the TAIL systems um, can provide an easy and robust way to develop genome engineering and epigenome engineering reagents to study both in animal and also cellular models uh, for a variety of uh, basic biological questions and uh, disease processes. All of our reagents described here have been deposited at Gene, so it's um, uh, readily accessible to, to the community. So finally, I just want to acknowledge our wonderful collaborators, uh, Luciano Mirafini, uh, David Auschiller's lab, uh, Phil Sharp's lab, uh, the RNAi platform at the Broad Institute, Rudolph and uh, Yi Zheng uh, at uh, uh, MIT, Whitehead, and also Harvard, respectively. And then also all the funding agencies, the NIH, the NIMH, um, the different private foundations like Cat Gates, McKnight, so forth, uh, who have provided funding to make this work possible. Um, thank you very much. Back to, back to you, John. And thank you, Feng, for your wonderful insights on genome editing using CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, we've learned a lot about CRISPRs from, from you and Rodolf, so thank you. 
Again, if you want to send a question to our panelists, please use the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. George Church is eagerly standing by and ready to continue our discussion. So, George, you're up. Thank you, John. Uh, this is uh, George Church uh, from Harvard, and I'm going to begin with my thank you slide and, and uh, thank the previous two speakers as well. This is also my conflict of interest uh, slide, and we're going to be focusing on applications, going beyond what the two speakers talk about to exactly how we're going to impact uh, medicine and uh, other systems. Now, we and others have explored uh, all seven of these DNA targeting systems over the year. CRISPR is the star today, but one of them involved is where DNA does the recognition in the genome, two, where RNA does the recognition, and four, where uh, proteins do the recognition. Um, the really powerful way uh, using RNA is, is uh, that you can just program 20 base pairs and, and move on from there, and so you can make hundreds of thousands of these. So just a quick review, you know, 1987, we saw this in Procurus and later in Archaebacteria. It wasn't until 2013 we saw them in uh, really applied to Eukaryotes. And now uh, over 16 different organisms, basically every organism that's been attempted um, can, uh, can use these to cleave or, or um, uh, epigenetically modify uh, cells. So, so that we're going to see these applications now that I'm focusing on uh, today. Um, so, uh, reviewing what uh, Rudolf and uh, uh, Fung said, um, Cas9 is large, but we, our lab and probably others, have developed smaller orthologs, um, and these fit fine into current vectors. Doesn't seem to be a limit. Uh, particularly, the PAM limitations, that is to say the protein components, have already been expanded uh, to many orthologs, and the, and the number grows uh, every day of well-characterized new PAMs. So that's not a big limitation. Fung mentioned the off-target cleavage um, being greatly improved, maybe a thousand-fold by pair nickases, and he also mentioned the shareability of this for adgene. So I'd like to take a, a, a moment to talk about the, the challenges of sharing um, uh, human data uh, in the context of the, of the CRISPR so that we can enable uh, pre-competitive uh, uh, technology uh, sharing and data sharing. One that's been anointed now by the National Institute of Standard Technology and the Food and Drug Administration for these human genome standards and one that we use extensively for testing the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 in for human uh, gene therapy and so forth are these uh, this, uh, personal genomes uh, cell cellular uh, components. Uh, this is the genome in a bottle. This is the genome standards, and they're starting with eight trios. We feel that this is the a major component of precision medicine is merging the whole genome sequencing and the um, next-gen editing of genomes such as CRISPR. Uh, this, this cohort has extensive uh, functional data, uh, environmental data, and it's, it, and it's uh, uh, the world's only open access data set. It's now international, many international centers. And we have these cell lines as, as fibroblasts or as um, IPS with uh, Cas9 already in it, and it's a very easy way to test out potential therapies, um, not only uh, gene therapies, but more conventional therapies. And if you'd like to uh, join us and learn more about that, there's an there's a annual meeting um, this April 29th and 30th, and, uh, and these are actually the participants who donated cells um, to this, this sort of uh, effort. So now, CRISPR. Um, we've, talk, we've talked about tools. We've talked about, li Fung mentioned libraries at the end, disease models that we can make in mouse and, uh, and primate and so forth. But the next step is deciding what we're going to aim this powerful technology at. We can, uh, uh, some, some diseases can be prevented by proper gene counseling. And so there's a subset of these which are, um, uh, more appropriately uh, dealt with by gene therapy, and, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. There's soma versus germline. The ultimate in preventative medicine will be germline, but I think we're going to be seeing mainly soma uh, until the, the, the safety and efficacy is unambiguously uh, proven uh, for many uh, diseases. 
Um, we can fix rare diseases. I think that will be uh, some of the early applications. But there's some interesting common allele applications. I think in the long term that will be uh, the killer app because gene counseling will deal with so many of the rare diseases. We can uh, currently there are about 2,000 gene therapies, mostly involve adding a gene that's missing. But CRISPR enables greatly enables deletion and alteration. We can have uh, low levels of multiplexing, basically changing one place in one in the genome, or we can have high levels. And why why we do that uh, at high levels is an interesting question. Um, and two examples as to what your appetite for high level multiplexing is: uh, uh, it's developing organs for transplantation, either in um, changing uh, human or animal systems. And then there's ecosystem engineering, which CRISPR can be applied to in, in a variety of ways. So how do we do multiplexing? What is What are the limits here? Here's an experiment where we use multiplexing for the epigenetic reprogramming uh, activation uh, that Rudolf uh, alluded to. And uh, and we and here you can put in 10 different uh, uh, guide RNAs simultaneously, and the 10 is much more powerful than any of them individually, getting, in this case, 35-fold uh, induction. And uh, another paper that used 73 guide RNAs um, uh, simultaneously, not necessarily uh, proven to be all at once, but we're getting sort of into the range where we don't really know where the up upper limit is for this sort of multiplexing. So one of the things that's incredibly enabling uh, about CRISPR uh, is this ability to make dozens hundreds of thousands of guide RNAs and test either in low throughput or high throughput hypotheses. So the hypotheses flowing out of uh, genome sequencing and other uh, association studies can now be tested on very small cohorts. False positives are no longer as uh, daunting as they used to be. And so N of 1 studies where we move from correlation, which you might get in large cohorts, to causality, which can be tested in small ones. The tests can be either in animals uh, or in humans, or human cells, human organoids. And here's an example of one where you have very, very rare uh, 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 traits, not necessarily diseases, where you have a myostatin double null in, in humans or a myostatin receptor double null in these two uh, young individuals on the left, and then reproduced in three different animal models, uh, cows, dogs, and mice. And that's causality. You could also do it in humans if, for some reason or other, the animal model is not appropriate, is missing that anatomical structure or physiology. You can do it in, uh, in human organoids, and these are getting increasingly sophisticated and, and increasingly well vetted for their relationship to natural human organs. Um, and uh, I urge you to take a look at this, uh, this review article, and, um, and, and we've had a wonderful um, uh, interaction with our colleagues at the Wies Institute for Biologically <clears throat> Inspired of, um, Engineering, and Don Ingber and Kit Parker uh, have, uh, have been working on, for example, the lungs and the cardiac um, uh, uh, models, and, the, and we can introduce with CRISPR uh, human uh, mutations, either from the literature, databases, or um, and, and and ask what our particular position out of the millions of three million that might differentiate between two people, you can introduce one at a time and see whether a particular base pair or, or small region is um, necessary and sufficient for physiological impact um, at the molecular, cellular, and, and tissue level. For example, contractility of, of heart um, tissue or um, or, you know, physiology of lung ownership and so on. So how do we make this decision as to which genes are the appropriate ones? We have, uh, if we have uh, gene, gene therapy, um, do we apply it to genes that, can, that, that are currently handled by uh, genetic counseling, such as Tay-Sachs, which has been almost eliminated um, uh, via gene therapy, uh, sorry, by gene counseling? So we're, there are now uh, over 1,970 gene therapy clinical trials um, 
whether they're viral or non-viral delivery, mostly adding genes in phase one, two, and three uh, clinical trial. There's one that's already emerged, uh, Glybera, uh, licensed or approved in Europe. But these, many of these are, are curing these rare diseases, which is in, becoming increasingly uh, possible to detect with carrier testing, not of one gene at a time based on your family history, but um, dozens at a time, uh, and, and very soon the whole genome um, at, uh, at a cost that is embedded in your in your healthcare. But here's an example of a company, Good Start Genetics, um, and they have a panel that's, that that can be suggested by ethnicity or by family, or can be just done um, preventatively in general. But you can see there's a large number of these that can be done simultaneously. So. Um, and that brings us to those, those are mostly rare and they can be detected uh, in the, the father, the potential father and mother and uh, avoided. But if the father and mother sh uh, share allele, they have, they have no, uh, really no way out, or let's say the entire human race for the most part shares alleles, we have um, uh, a more, a larger market and a more serious problem. And there are examples of, uh, of these variations, which we'll call rare protective alleles, rather than the rare deleterious ones, these are the rare protective alleles. And we have um, some examples here. The myostatin I already mentioned, LRP5, results in extremely strong bones, the opposite of osteoporosis. And this is a particular allele in a heterozygous state. Uh, example here, glycine 171 to valine. PCSK9 is really exciting. You can lower coronary artery disease. In heterozygous and homozygous, you lower LDL cholesterol to unbelievably low levels, um, and people are, are quite healthy. CCR5, CXCR4, and FUT2 all in their double null state uh, remove uh, the receptor from the surface of the cells uh, that would be um, the virus receptor for either HIV1 or uh, norovirus. And finally, APP, of this particular allele, A673T, uh, is not predisposing to Alzheimer's in a rare deleterious sense, but it's actually protective. Now, what do we do with these rare protective alleles? Almost nobody has them, and we'd like to get them out to uh, the world. These various gene editing, gene targeting methods that, that we've been taught, that I mentioned in my very first slide, um, one of them is already in phase two clinical trials from Sangamo. Um, this is a zinc finger nuclease, but it's it's, it's illustrative of, of what's writing right behind them uh, in the, with the CRISPR. And in this case, you have, you'll make a double-strand break where the protein determines where in the genome the needle in the haystack, one in three billion base pairs, to cleave, and you make a mess with non-homologous enjoining, as Fung has uh, described. Uh, you basically insert or delete a small number of base pairs, highly variable, uh, uh, but uh, enough to knock to make a null, in this case, CCR5 and a double null will mean that the T cells from that patient, his own or her own T cells taken out and put back in, um, uh, will make them or, or put into the into the um, precursor cells will make them resistant uh, to the HIV, even if they have full blown AIDS at the time. This is a huge breakthrough, not only because you're removing DNA, which is not what most gene therapies have done in the past. You're removing, but you're also treating something that's very common. Essentially, everybody on the planet, with a very small number of exceptions, um, has a functional CCR5 gene or two. Now, to generalize this a bit more, um, or, and, to, and to illustrate the difference between non homologous and joining, where you make a single cut and, make, and, and essentially remove the functionality of that gene, um, you can make two cuts, and you can get a clean deletion, and it tends to be less of a mess. It's exactly what you want. It tends to be precise. Or you can use two cuts um, with two guide RNAs and two, and hence two CRISPR complexes um, and bring in a, tar a donor DNA and do the homologous recombination. And here, um, uh, Susan Byrne and uh, colleagues are illustrating this by changing a human cell surface for uh, protein Phi1 with a mouse uh, equivalent um, mouse by one, and uh, this is done by fax analysis. We have great uh, antibody fluorescent antibody reagents for both the human by one and the mouse by one, and so you can see this transition from the human by one and the 
the uh, lower right uh, quadrant of each of these four faxes uh, going uh, from left to right. You've got one with just the left guide RNA, one with just the right guide RNA, one with both, and then the control with no guide RNAs. And you can see in that no guide RNA on the far right, it, everything's in the human quadrant, and then with both the left and the right, you have um, a high percentage um, that has been converted um, to, to mouse by one, essentially without selection. Um, but we're using facts here to do, to do quantitation. So in, uh, in summary, we're, we've, uh, first two speakers introduced us to these wonderful, uh, the history of uh, CRISPR, the tools, the libraries that one can make, hundreds of thousands, uh, interesting disease models and animals, and they were moving this into um, gene therapy. Um, Fung and I and others have founded a company called Editas, um, but there, there will be uh, many, many opportunities uh, here, and there will be an interesting uh, discussion of just as, it be, as we determine whether it is very safe and very effective um, in somatic gene therapy, there will be um, a discussion of further preventative medicine. And we will have the opportunity doing common alleles, um, treating uh, problems that, that are common to most humans uh, or maybe all of us, um, like aging and dying. And finally, uh, just to emphasize the real power here is we can delete and alter and that we can make, uh, we can try out a large number uh, either simultaneously uh, uh, or iteratively. So thank you very much. Back to John. And George, thank you. Um, I'm not exaggerating. When I see your talk as well as those of your two colleagues, it was a veritable tour de force on CRISPR. So thank you all. Before we begin our Q&A session, I'd like to ask you to disable your pop-up blockers. A short survey on this webinar will be appearing in a moment, and very much appreciate your feedback on this webinar. Okay, so let's take a question from the audience. Rudolf, uh, we have an interesting question for you. Does Cas9 cleavage also leave cohesive ends? Um. Thus far, in uh, native Cas9 systems that have been biochemically characterized, um, published and unpublished, it, it does appear as though all um, a cleavage generates double-stranded DNA breaks blunt. Um, but if you're interested in having overhangs, one option would be to use the uh, Nikase variant in combination with overlapping spacers to, to target the two different strands. Okay, thank you. Fang, a question for you. How can we use this method to identify the function of different genes? In other words, what are the uses of CRISPRs in functional genomics? Thank. Did we lose you, Fang? Hello, um, I'm here. Sorry, I think I, my speaker was on mute. Okay. Um, so. Do you have that question? How can we use this method to identify the function of different genes? In other words, what are the uses of CRISPRs in functional genomics? So CRISPR can be used to achieve uh, efficient gene knockout uh, in different kinds of uh, functional experiments. For example, one of the recent studies that we reported, uh, we can generate a library of CRISPRs targeting uh, almost every single gene uh, in the genome. And then by applying uh, this library of CRISPR in an analogous fashion as shRNA libraries, we can uh, knock out uh, individually uh, different genes and then apply uh, selection pressure to see what are the functions of specific genes uh, in a given biological output. So for example, you can identify mutations that confer drug resistance uh, to different kinds of cancer uh, drugs. Thank you, Feng. And George? Will offset targeting strategies decrease the recombinant efficiency? So the, uh, the offset targeting uh, or double NICA strategy um, does not uh, appear to Im impact recombinant efficiency. In fact, there's a late breaking news from Keith Young's lab that if you reduce the guide RNA by a few a couple of nucleotides at the five prime end and add that to the double NICA cases, you can bring the, the targeting of efficiency the off-targeting down by a factor of 5,000, and n none of those uh, has an impact on recombinant efficiency. 
Hey, thank you. And Rudolf, uh, for, homo for homologous recombination, what's the maximum insertion length? Also, is DS out at two sites better than DS out at one site? Um, to the best of my knowledge, I, th I think this is yet to be determined whether there's a limit as to how large the templates can be for insertions. Um, but there's some, some preliminary evidence that it can be several hundred base pairs, maybe even several KBs. Um, but but, but, but we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit for that. With regards to the other part of the question, I mean, I think having two cuts uh, is an advantage in terms of increasing selection and, 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 pre and, and pressure and um, cleavage efficiency, but it will likely come at the cost of uh, survival of the cells and then efficiency of recombinations. Okay, thank you. And Fang, uh, this is a very interesting question. How does the CRISPR system avoid attacking the host bacterial genome? And this pertains to controlling off-target cleavage events. The way that, um, the way that CRISPR uh, avoids cutting the, the native bacterial genome is by the recognition or the requirement of a PAM sequence. In the CRISPR locus, uh, even though the target sequence is present, that sequence is not flanked by the uh, pro protospacer adjacent motif, the PAM sequence. And so uh, that's how the enzyme avoids cutting it. Okay, great. And George, is there a way to select between NHEJ and HDR for further genetic modification after the introduction of the double strand break? Well, so uh, first of all, you, you, you can bias uh, HDR versus NHEJ by not making a double strand break. By putting in a single NIC, you uh, heavily bias it towards uh, recombination in, in many of the systems that have been characterized. It's not necessarily completely general. Uh, you will reduce the efficiency, the overall efficiency, but the ratio uh, changes considerably. Furthermore, if you put two uh, double-strand breaks, um, you'll get a clean deletion with uh, generally with no, um, none of the collateral damage you get with non-homologous enjoining. Okay. And Rudolf, oh, how are insertions made? Um, essentially, insertions are generated by uh, the, the design of the template you use for homology-directed recombination, HDR or, or HR, and, and what you have to do is in your template sequence you provide as a cure for the, the cleavage repair, uh, you have to essentially separate um, the, the spacer sequence and especially the, 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 the cleavage part at the three prime end and on one side, and then on the other side, you would have to uh, to, to to put the PAM in the, in the re 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 repair template. So you have to separate the PAM from the spacer and insert your your uh, target there. Okay, and we have a question. I'm going to direct it first to Dr. Fang, and then uh, George can take the same question. Is it possible for a new array to have homology with genomic DNA, which would cause cutting cutting events? within the bacterial genome. Fang first. Um, sorry, could you maybe restate the question? Sure, yeah, it's, um, sometimes I have to try to interpret these. Is it possible for a new array to have homology with genomic DNA, mm -hmm. which would cause the cutting events within the bacterial genome? I'm not quite sure what that means, but want to give it a go? So, sure, um, so the CRISPR arrays um, are assembled by having concatenated uh, RAP sequences interspaced by the target sequence. Um, the requirement for cleavage of a target sequence is that it has to be flanked by the right PAM sequence. And usually uh, the natural CRISPR system avoids uh, self-cleavage by not choosing target sites that are similar to the RAP sequence, at least on the three prime end. And, um, and so uh, it depends on what the, what the array that has been generated, as long as um, the individual recognition sites don't have the PAM sequence, uh, then it, won't, uh, it should not be cut. George, can you take that too? I, I, I think Funk did a great job. Okay, then let's move over to Rudolf, and let me get down to this question. Uh, Rudolf, what is the difference between RUIC plus uh, HNH, looks like plus, and are you, yeah, it's not coming out clear, RUIC and HNH plus? Do they not result in single-strand cuts? 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming the, the question pertains to the variant functional forms uh, of Cas9 with, with RUVC plus or minus in combination with HNH plus or minus uh, active domains. And, and, and essentially both variants would be single-strand DNA knee cases, but the strand that would be nicked by the RUVC plus versus the strand nicked by the HNH plus would be on opposite sides of the DNA helix. So whether you want to nick on the plus strand or specifically on the minus strand, uh, you would have to use the variant accordingly. So it's a question of orientation on your helix. Okay, thank you. And Fang, uh, which CRISPR system, which CRISPR-Cas system will be efficient to knock down long non-coding RNAs? Um, there are different strategies of uh, knocking down a gene. Uh, for non-coding genes, you may choose to introduce uh, two different guide RNAs that flank the non-coding uh, RNA of interest, and Cas9 uh, will be able to excise out the non-coding RNA. Okay, and George, question for you. Uh, is it feasible to correct large, greater than five kilobyte deletions, losses, or duplications gained? So with uh, homologous recombination, you can um, insert. We don't know what the upper limit for insertion is, but it's, it's probably similar to uh, previous homologous recombination and probably quite large with, uh, say, bacterial artificial chromosome um, 100 kilobase uh, type of substrates. Uh, I, the, the, the largest that I've heard of for deletions is on the order of um, 10 megabases, so you can really have very large uh, deletions, um, so, which would cover, which you, you could use that to remove uh, duplications. The limits would, of course, be if you have highly repetitive sequences of getting just the right number of repeats out. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but, but please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.janangnews.com. If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your friends and colleagues, which we highly recommend. Also, we had quite a lot of questions in this webinar, and the panelists will try uh, to answer as many as they can, uh, you know, Hopefully, they'll be able to get to some of these. Hey, I want to thank the panel again for the outstanding presentations, and I say thank you to our audience for your attention and for your very, very thoughtful questions about various topics brought up during the webinar. And thank you to our sponsor, Origin. Bye for now.